Mendelian Inheritance by Dr. Bruce Korf, in collaboration with the University of Alabama at Birmingham. My name is Bruce Korf. I'm a medical geneticist in the Department of Genetics at University of Alabama at Birmingham. This talk will focus on the principles of Mendelian inheritance. We'll first describe the basic patterns of Mendelian inheritance, that is autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, and sex-linked. We'll explain the concepts of penetrance and expressivity, and then the notion of X chromosome inactivation. Basic Patterns of Mendelian Inheritance The basis for Mendelian inheritance is the fact that humans are a diploid organism. We call the non-sex chromosomes autosomes, and any individual will have inherited one copy of each autosome from each parent, that is, one from mother, one from father. The sex chromosomes consist of two X's in females and an X and a Y chromosome in males. If one focuses on any particular gene, it's possible that both copies, each one inherited from one of the parents, are the same, which we refer to as homozygous, or they can be different from one another, in which case we say the individual is heterozygous. The two copies of any particular gene are called alleles, and the particular alleles for any particular gene locus refer to the individual's genotype. The physical expression of a genotype is the phenotype, in this case, for example, having blue eyes or brown eyes. The first major pattern of genetic transmission we'll consider is autosomal recessive. In this case, a particular genetic mutation needs to be present in a homozygous form in order for a phenotype to occur. The dominant version is referred to here as big A, the recessive is little a, and so only the homozygote for little a shows the phenotype, the heterozygote does not, and of course the homozygote for big A also does not. If one looks at a family tree, both parents are heterozygous carriers, and they have a one in four chance that they both transmit the little a to a child, and that child will be affected, that is, will show the phenotype. There is a one in two chance that either of them, but not both, transmits little a, in which case a child is heterozygous, and a one in four chance that a child inherits big A from both parents, and that child too will be unaffected. For rare autosomal recessive traits, there tends to be an increased frequency of consanguinity, that is, where the parents may be close relatives. This is an example where this child is homozygous for little a, and her great-grandfather was heterozygous for what may be an exceedingly rare allele in the population. But he transmitted little a to his daughter, who in turn transmitted it to her son, who transmitted it to this child, and simultaneously was transmitted from him to his son, then to his daughter, and then finally to this child. Certainly not all instances of consanguinity result in homozygosity for medically significant traits, and not all instances of homozygosity are the consequence of consanguinity, but again, for rare traits, one tends to see an increased frequency of consanguinity. We say that the child is identical by descent, which means these two alleles actually are copies of this original allele just a few generations back, and would be expected to be the same down to the nucleotide level in the DNA. In fact, that could be viewed as more the exception than the rule. We refer to genetic heterogeneity either as different loci responsible for a similar disorder or different types of mutations in the same gene that can be responsible for a similar disorder. An example of gene locus heterogeneity is shown at the left, where one parent is homozygous for the A gene and the other for the B gene, and their offspring are going to be heterozygous for both, but homozygous for neither, and hence unaffected. Common example would be hereditary deafness, where it's not rare for parents to get together because of perhaps sharing a common language, like sign language. But if multiple different genes can be responsible for deafness, as is the case, it's possible for the children to be heterozygous, but not homozygous.
Now, in contrast, allelic heterogeneity means that different types of mutations, so these rectangles are the gene, and the squares within them are the mutations. This parent is a carrier for the yellow mutation, this one for the green mutation. The child is heterozygous for both. We call this compound heterozygosity not identical by descent, as would be the case in consanguinity, but if both these mutations have a severe effect on the function of the gene, the child would be considered homozygous, not necessarily for the same mutation, but at least for some mutation, and would be expected to show the phenotype. Autosomal recessive. The prototype autosomal recessive traits are inborn errors of metabolism, a term coined in the early part of the 20th century by the British physician Archibald Garrod. He recognized patterns of inheritance that resembled Mendelian recessive inheritance, studying, for example, alcaptanuria, a metabolic defect in the breakdown of tyrosine. Here, in fact, is the pathway of tyrosine metabolism. The alcaptanuria block occurs fairly late in metabolism and leads to a buildup of homogentisic acid, particularly in cartilage. Perhaps a more familiar disorder is phenylalanine hydroxylase deficiency resulting in phenylketonuria, or PKU, where there's a failure of the enzyme that converts phenylalanine to tyrosine leading to a deficiency of tyrosine and some of its byproducts, including melanin, which is why individuals with PKU tend to be fair-skinned, but most importantly, a buildup of phenylalanine and a toxic product, phenylpyruvic acid, which is responsible for the neurological problems. The paradigm of an inborn era of metabolism is the notion that there are enzymatic pathways where normally substrate A is acted on by enzyme A to produce product B, which in turn is acted on by enzyme B to produ produce C, and so forth. And each of the enzymes responsible for these reactions is the product itself of a different gene. So if there's a mutation of gene C, that means there'll be a failure of enzyme C to be made, and hence the reaction of C to D will not take place, and there will be an accumulation then of substrates A, B, and C, and a deficiency of products D and E. And the phenotype can result from any combination of these deficiency and accumulation phenomena. Why are, are autosomal recessive traits recessive? Well, at least for an enzyme deficiency, the answer comes from the catalytic nature of enzymes. If we imagine that the red triangles are the enzyme and the blue squares are the substrate, normally the enzyme binds, cleaves the substrate, and then is released and can once again bind to additional substrate. A homozygous individual for a mutation, let's say, produces no enzyme whatsoever, and hence the reaction fails to occur. But a heterozygous individual might produce 50% of the normal amount of enzyme, and because of the catalytic nature of enzyme, that may be sufficient to carry out the reaction to a point where no phenotype is seen. So it takes complete reduction of enzyme levels in order to actually fail to carry out the reaction and result in a phenotype. Autosomal dominant. The second major mode of genetic transmission is autosomal dominant. Here, an affected individual can either be homozygous or heterozygous for that particular mutated allele, which is depicted here by the capital A. So the only individuals who will be unaffected are the homozygotes for small a. Now, in humans, the majority of medically significant autosomal dominant traits are seen most typically in heterozygous individuals and not so often in homozygous individuals. There are two reasons for this. One is if they're extremely rare, it's unlikely that very many individuals will be the product of a mating where both parents are carriers, and so there'll be very few homozygotes. Another reason, though, is that in many cases for medically significant autosomal dominant traits, the homozygous individual is in fact more severely affected than a heterozygote, and this is often a lethal combination. So strictly speaking, they are not really dominant in the sense that there is a difference in the phenotype between homozygotes and heterozygotes, but they're dominant to the extent that the heterozygote will show a phenotype. Here's a typical family tree. 
where affected individuals are heterozygous, unaffected individuals homozygous for little a. Any particular individual has a 50-50 chance of transmitting the gene to any offspring. Males can transmit to either males or females, and the same could be said for females. In some cases, a child may be the first affected member of a family to have an autosomal dominant trait. This can arise due to a new genetic mutation, that is a mutation that occurred in the sperm cell or the egg cell that formed the child. Because only one of the two alleles needs to be altered by mutation, the child will be affected if either the sperm or the egg acquired a new genetic mutation. Penetrance and expressivity. Now an important concept that tends to be encountered particularly in dominant traits, although in fact it occurs in recessives as well, is that of penetrance, which is technically defined as the fraction of individuals who carry a particular gene, or gene mutation really, who actually manifest some specified phenotype. So you can see instances of non-penetrance in these two families. Here's a child whose parent is affected and whose child in turn is affected, but this individual is depicted as being unaffected. So assuming this is a rare trait and that this child is affected with a mutation in the same gene as this individual, we can presume that the mutation passed through this one but somehow is not manifest. So this individual would be said to be non-penetrant. In this family, notice that in the youngest generation so far, nobody is affected, in spite of the fact that these four children would have been at risk because they have an affected parent. So something is going on where this trait does not manifest itself, at least not at a young age. In fact, there is a phenomenon of age-dependent penetrance. The best known example is Huntington disease, where the phenotype, in this case we're looking at the percent affected who carry the actual gene mutation, on the y-axis versus age, so virtually nobody will show signs of Huntington disease at birth. And it's quite rare to show them even in the childhood years. But the older you are, the more probable it is that you will show signs. And if you live long enough, it is virtually certain. Now this curve is not derived from Huntington's data, but the concept is essentially the same. Now another concept that sometimes is confused with penetrance is that of expressivity. And it's graphically depicted by these two pictures of the backs of individuals with neurofibromatosis type 1. This is a condition that causes tumors to form along peripheral nerves. These are both adults, and you can see just a huge number of neurofibromas on the skin on the right, and only a relatively small number on the left. Same condition, but very different degrees of expression. So expressivity constitutes differences in the mode of expression of a phenotype or the degree of expression. For example, depicted here, the overall number of dermal neurofibromas an individual might get with neurofibromatosis type 1. One way of thinking about the difference between penetrance and expressivity is depicted in this diagram. Let's imagine the phenotype in question is shown in the pink. It could be a trait, quantitative trait, uh, perhaps height in individuals with tall stature due to some genetic condition. So there's a bell-shaped curve of height in the general population. Some people are short, some are tall, most are somewhere in between. And for the phenotype, there is similarly a bell-shaped curve. Some people are on the shorter side for that condition, some quite tall. You notice a bit of overlap. There are some people in the general population who are as tall as some of the shorter people with the trait. We would say that the range of height could be described as the range of expressivity. Somewhere we draw a line, though, when we say that penetrance with regard to this particular trait and this particular condition is an all or none phenomenon. You either have the trait, or at least this trait of height, if you're to the right of this line and you don't have it if you're to the left of this line. Now sometimes the distinction between dominance and recessiveness is not so obvious. Here's an example of an autosomal recessive trait that seems to be transmitted from a mother to her daughter. And the way this comes about is that it's a relatively common trait and in this case a homozygous female has a partner who himself is heterozygous. 
So she faces a 100% chance of transmitting the mutation to either of her offspring, and for him it would be a 50-50 chance. So this child has inherited the trait and is affected, this one not. This will occur if the particular trait in question is relatively common in the population. A good example is hemochromatosis, where in individuals of Celtic ancestry, the carrier frequency can be as high as 1 in 10. So it would not be rare for a homozygous individual to have a heterozygous partner, and hence 50% of their offspring will be affected, even though the mode of inheritance really is recessive. So one needs to be alert to whether one is dealing with a common or a rare trait in the population in assessing the recurrence risk in a family. X linkage. The third major pattern of Mendelian inheritance is X linkage. This occurs when the gene is inherited on the X chromosome. Remember that males get an X and a Y and females two X's. A male will be affected if the mutation is present on that one X, whereas a female would only be affected if she's homozygous. This is likely to be a rare event if one is dealing with a rare allele. So you see a pedigree often like this. A carrier female can transmit the trait to half her sons or carrier status to half her daughters, and this carrier can transmit again to half her sons either the mutated X or the non-mutated X, and half her daughters either will be carriers or unaffected. The hallmark of X linkage is you never get male-to-male -male transmission because a male transmits the Y, not the X, to his son. If an affected male is able to reproduce, all of his daughters will inherit that mutation-bearing X, and female carriers transmit the gene to, on average, half of their offspring. Now, one can have X-linked dominant traits, as depicted here, where both males and females are affected. And notice that a female transmits, on average, to half of her offspring, and a male to all of his daughters, but to none of his sons. A special case is X-linked dominant with male lethality, depicted here by incontinentia pigmenti, a condition that causes these streaky areas of hyperpigmentation on the skin, neurologic problems, dental problems and um, problems with vision. This is an X-linked trait that is lethal in the what is called hemizygous state of a male carrying that mutation on his X. Females, on the other hand, can survive with this trait because they are heterozygous and this ameliorates the phenotype, and so they transmit it to half their offspring. If those offspring are male, they tend to die in utero and miscarry, often before the woman knows she's pregnant, whereas if it's transmitted to a daughter, she'll manifest the phenotype. One interesting point here is you notice the streakiness of this hyperpigmentation, islands of pigmented skin and then other areas of non-pigmented skin. And this graphically depicts the phenomenon of X chromosome inactivation. Early in development, one of the two X chromosomes in a female is inactivated, depicted here by the red color. The choice of whether it's the maternal or paternal X is random during early development, but once that occurs, it is consistent in all of the descendants of that original cell. So in any particular cell, only one of the two X chromosomes will be expressed in a female. And this explains, in fact, this streaky hyperpigmentation, because 50% of the cells in this individual would have expressed the mutation-bearing X, and this causes spillage of pigment into skin, where those cells were the active cells, and then 50% would have normal pigmentation because the X chromosome that is active in those cells carries the normal allele. X chromosome inactivation does not apply to every single gene on the X chromosome. There are regions of homology on both the short arm and long arm of the X and the Y which escape X inactivation, and there are several other genes on the X that also escape inactivation. So in summary, an autosomal recessive trait will be manifest phenotypically in a homozygous individual. Two carrier parents have a 1 in 4 risk of transmitting the mutation to any particular offspring.
an autosomal dominant will be expressed only in a heterozygous individual for the mutation or possibly in a homozygous individual if this does not produce a phenotype so severe as to be lethal. If an individual is heterozygous, they face a 50% chance of transmitting that mutation to any offspring. And finally, X linkage will be most typically expressed in hemizygous males who have only one X chromosome, but they will be, there will be no male-to-male -male transmission. The next talk will be considering exceptions to Mendelian inheritance and then looking at issues such as multifactorial inheritance. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.